Analytical Chemistry 1, Lesson 10. The challenge with errors or uncertainty is that we do not usually make a chemical measurement, and then that's the end of it. Rather, our measurements feed into some additional analysis, meaning we combine our measurement data with other data in specific mathematical ways to be able to interpret and reach conclusions regarding our data. For example, when you carry out a titration with a burette, you have to make two readings, the volume marker at the beginning and again when you have reached the end point. Both of those measurements had error associated with them. How does that influence your result when you take the difference to find the volume of titrant added? Every chemical analysis utilizes several different instruments, each with their own peculiar uncertainty. The output from each device is combined in some functional form to produce the desired result. At the same time, the error or uncertainty associated with each measurement are combined in some other functional form to estimate how the errors from the measurements propagate into the uncertainty of the final value that is reported. Consider making up a solution of our sodium nitrate. We may have a sample, add it to a volumetric flask, fill with purified water to the mark, and agitate to dissolve. What is the molarity of that solution? But how certain are you in quoting or using that value? So let's say that you use the tear function on the analytical balance and weighed a sample of sodium nitrite. Now remember to weigh it to constant weight back and forth between the oven, the desiccator, and the balance. And had a weight of 5.2944 grams. You put this into a 100 milliliter volumetric flask, class A glassware, and finished making up the solution. If we assume you have been trained and practiced in using the balance in the flask, then we anticipate that no additional errors beyond that of the instruments themselves. Hence, a standard deviation of the weighing is plus or minus 0 0.0002 grams, and that of the flask's volume measurement is plus or minus 0 0.08 milliliters. We seek molarity, so we have to divide the mass by the molar mass of sodium nitrite and then by the volume to find molarity. However, the molar mass of sodium nitrite is a combination of the measured masses of sodium, nitrogen, and oxygen, each of which has a known uncertainty associated with it. The molar mass of sodium nitrite is the appropriate sum of these atomic masses. It is 68.99551 grams per mole. Now I'm carrying some extra sig figs since this is an intermediate calculation. Divide the mass by the molar mass to get 0 0.076735 moles of sodium nitrite that were put into the flask. Divide by the volume to find the molarity, 0.76735 molar. But what is our certainty in this number? How does the uncertainty of the other numbers control our knowledge of the solution's concentration. Errors propagate through our calculations. The study of error propagation is quite a sophisticated analysis involving linear algebra and calculus. Over the years, scientists and engineers have come to an approximation that has proven very successful in most situations and has become the standard of practice. A thorough derivation of the equations is outside the scope of our course. At the same time, you really need to appreciate where these equations come from and the assumptions about which you need to be aware. First just a refresher about our notation. Every measurement has a population mean mu. This is the value measured for an infinite or at least a very large number of identical measurements. In practice we often make a small number of measurements which can produce our sample mean which is sometimes called the average. We often denote this with a variable with a bar over the top. We might use either one of these in different situations. For instance when using the 100 milliliter volumetric flask we fill it to the mark and assume it is 100 milliliters. That is the population mean. We might do that a hundred times and weigh the flask very accurately to determine the volume. But that's what the manufacturer has already done. We accept that and we accept that if, and this is the reason you've come to this class, if you have been correctly trained and you have learned and applied what you've been taught, and if you carefully apply your learning, then you can fill the volumetric flask in such a manner as to have a mean of 100.00 milliliters. Now warning, you can always do this wrong. You might get sloppy, you might get distracted, and if so, this all goes out the window. When you get a result that is substantially different from what you should be getting, look to your technique to improve it. Now each of these measurements also has a standard deviation associated with it. There is a population standard deviation given by sigma, and there is a sample standard deviation given by lowercase s. The population variance is sigma squared and the sample variance is s squared. That same volumetric flask has a population standard deviation of 0 0.08 milliliters, and we use this in our calculations. If we have a population parameter, we can use it. But if we do not, then we can measure and use the sample parameter by doing several independent measurements. Imagine that you are able to measure the properties x, y, and z. 
Some function f of x, y, and z combines them to provide your desired result. You also know the standard deviation for each of these variables, s sub x, sub y, and sub z. For instance, in determining the molarity of the sodium nitrite solution above, we have mass, volume, and atomic masses as the input data. The function we are seeking divides the mass of the sodium nitrite by the sum of the atomic masses, now remembering to multiply oxygen by two, and then dividing the result by the volume. If you try to analyze the way the small variations, we might also call, call them errors, in each of the variables leads to variations in the results, you will find that you will need to deal with variance and covariance. Covariance arises when changes in two of the variables are correlated together to some extent. A Taylor series expansion can also be used to describe some of the leading terms. There is a lot that goes into the full analysis of error propagation. If you're interested, I suggest this rather old but very thorough treatment of the subject as found in this journal article by Ku. The bottom of line for our course is the following. We can reasonably assume that the errors, the variations, and the variables are small compared to their mean values. This assumption makes retaining the first order derivatives in the Taylor series a valid action while ignoring the higher order terms. An expression for the variance in the function f is written in this form. The terms involving a single variable are the variance. Those involving a pair of variables are the covariance between the two variables. In the kinds of experiments with which we are commonly involved, we are also able to reasonably assume that the variables are uncorrelated, that they are independent. Now, this may not always be the case, but we leave these complexities for future courses for you. For now, we can see, for instance, how the weighing of the sodium nitrite is in no way dependent upon the volume measurement of the volumetric flask. They are independent variables and are not correlated to each other. When we do that, the covariant terms go to zero. We are left with the derivatives of the function f with respect to each variable. Each is expressing how the function f changes with changes in each of those variables. The derivatives are the way the function changes, and the variable standard deviation is how much that variable changes. If we square that, we have the way the variance changes, and this is what we need to sum together.